So linear programming was designed to solve real-world problems efficiently and quickly. Let's consider the fun example of owning a movie theater. How many movie schedules do we have to consider? Well, for definiteness, let's say we have 10 screens, 14 possible two-hour movies, start the day at noon, end at midnight, and break the day into 10-minute blocks. We have over 10 to the 800 possible things to study. The number is absolutely staggering. To put into perspective, if every subatomic particle in the universe was a supercomputer checking schedules for us since the dawn of time, we wouldn't have even made a dent in the problem today. This shows us that even though brute force is great in terms of stating what we need to do and enumerating how to check them, from a practical point of view, it's too slow to get things done in real time. We need a better way. And that better way is linear programming. So how does linear programming cut down on the number of possibilities to check? The following example does a great job of illustrating what's going on. Imagine you have five queens and a 5x5 five five chessboard. You want to put the queens on the board in such a way as to maximize the number of pawns that can be safely placed on the board. Remember, queens attack diagonally, horizontally, and vertically. A little thought gives configurations that spear zero, one, or two pawns. But can three be done? So I chose this problem for illustrative purposes. Brute force isn't too bad here, but for more complicated real-world problems, like our movie scheduling, it's impractical. How many places are there to place our first queen? You might say there are 25, as there are 25 squares on the board. While this is true, in some sense the answer is really six. Why six? Well, if we allow ourselves to rotate the board, the four corners are all the same, and those really are the same opening move. What about other squares on the board? Well, the four midpoints of the side are all the same, as are the four squares between the corner and the midpoints, and so on. If you continue in this way, allowing yourselves to flip the board and rotate, you see that there are really only six distinct possibilities. If you recall tic-tac-toe, you see that this is very similar to what goes on there. While tic-tac-toe has nine squares, there are really only three distinct first moves by symmetry. There's the middle square, there's the corner, and there's the side. So instead of saying there are 25 possibilities for the first move and then 24 for the second and so on and so on, we see it's much smaller. It starts with 6, not 25. It turns out that there's an even better method. Instead of putting down five queens so that three pawns are safe, let's consider the dual problem. Let's put down three queens so that five pawns are safe. What's nice about this is we're now looping on just three objects, three queens as opposed to five queens. Why does this help? Well, if we can put down three queens so that five pawns are safe, all we have to do is convert the queens to pawns and the pawns to queens, and we return to our original problem. This is a powerful principle. Often it's easier to study a related problem and then convert back to the original. Mathematics is filled with examples like this, where by cleverly regrouping, we can save hours of tedious algebra. In this course, we're going to see many examples of this. We're going to try to optimize some quantity, and we'll see that we can do it far better if we change our perspective and then convert back in the end. Thank you.